So welcome back. Uh, this time we're going to start talking about Book 3 of Plato's Republic. Uh, as I mentioned before, the this carries on the conversation that Socrates and Adamantus began at the end of Book 2, uh, where they're discussing the education of the guardians and um, talking about uh, different kinds of stories that children are told. And, and they go through and uh, investigate those things uh, now in considerable detail. And we're not going to talk about it in considerable detail uh, just because we don't really have the time. It's not, it's not necessary for the level of study we're involved in right now. Uh, and also um, because to really appreciate it, you need reasonable familiarity with the ancient Greek literature, Homer in particular, but other things. And so, and without that, it's, it's harder to appreciate the sense of some of the things that are said. Um, so I'm not going to go through uh, some of that material uh, in, in detail, but I want to say sort of generally what kinds of things are said there and reflect a little bit on their philosophical significance. That's the first thing I want to do. And then I want to move. So I, re, re, remember before Socrates said, you know, there's two main dimensions to education, music and gymnastic. And he said, first, we're going to educate the children with music, right? And then gymnastic. So what they do is they investigate first the musical education of children and then the gymnastic. So I'm going to talk in general about some of the things about music, broadly speaking. And then I want to jump in at near the end of that. Um, when they're talking about the significance of musical education. Um, there are a few specific things in there that I think are qu quite uh, meaningful to look at. Um, and then in gymnastic, uh, there, there are a number of things in there, broader discussion of gymnastic, which really is a discussion kind of of bodily health uh, and, and some other things. Um, I want to pick out some, some kind of important points. Um, as is the case with almost everything in Plato's writings, um, uh, in every con in, in, throughout this conversation, all kinds of stuff come comes up. So you might think, I don't care about studying the gymnastic education of, of elementary school children. Yeah, maybe. Although that's actually interesting, but maybe you don't want to study it. That's fine. But there's going to be an awful lot of stuff in the discussion here that isn't just about that. So you got to read through these materials to find these um, amazingly powerful little gems. Is a remarkable writer, a tricky one. Anyway, uh, so let me talk uh, talk generally about some of these points about music, then focus on the text about a few specific things about the significance of music, learning music, and then talk through some of the bigger issues that come up in the sections on gymnastic. Um, so we had ended book two with with the with these sort of uh, two laws that. Uh, that the Adamantus thinks, yeah, we got to have those. The one says uh, you can only portray the gods as good and as the cause of good, not not the cause of bad, and that the gods can't can't appear in misleading forms, and they don't appear in different forms, and therefore they have no use for lies. R uh, rough, roughly, those were the ideas behind the laws that what, you know how how the gods are going to have to be portrayed. So there, <clears throat> they're talking about the content that is to be portrayed. And they continue doing that um, in the first parts of book three. Uh, so it's, it's a very systematic study. Um, and, and that's the thing I sort of want to stress so that you kind of think about it. So they go through talking more about the content of some stories. And they talk about, you know, what you can portray in the stories of gods, what you should portray in the story of heroes, and then ultimately what you should portray in the stories of human beings. Um, and then, uh, Right around the time they get to that, the stories of human beings, um, Socrates then switches to a different kind of topic. He says, well, if you're really going to be discussing what the poets do, I mean, this is under the broad heading of music, poetry understood as the gift of the muses. So it's part of, broadly speaking, what they're calling music, poetry, poetry is. Um, uh, if, if, so it turns out if you're going to talk about poetry... Yes, you, you can talk about the manifest content of the thing, or it's a story about a god doing this. But, but in a way, what makes it poetry is, is all the stuff that isn't that. So then they go on and talk about style. The, the Greek word is lexis. Um, style is the translation here, and that's good enough. Uh, but as Socrates says at one point, so we're, instead of talking about what is presented, we're going to talk about how it's presented. 
Now that could mean a lot of things, but it means something specific here. He uh, he distinguishes between uh, things that are portrayed by the poet in the form of a kind of direct uh, narration. Then Achilles did this. Then Priam did this. Then so on. Right, where it's clear that it's the uh, the voice of the poet speaking, describing, narrating some other events. He distinguishes between that and what he calls uh, imitation or mimesis, uh, which might better be, even be translated than imitation. It might be better translated as reenactment, but imitation is fine here. It's not always fine. It's fine here. And so he says, you know, sometimes what happens is you have uh, a poem that portrays it as if the character being considered is himself speaking. Right. So instead of the poet saying, Achilles said this, it would, you would just have Achilles portrayed as saying something, uh, which then is what you would expect, especially, for example, in drama, in, in uh, tragedies and comedies, right? You have uh, the sort of pretending that that actual character is present. So they talk about that. They talk about the significance of the difference between these two types of presentation, and that's one of the things I'm going to come back and refer to in a minute. Um, and then they move on to from there uh, to talking about music in the sense that we would more normally use that word. So in other words, not those things that could be the texts of songs or you know the, the or the poems, um, but but the as they say, harmony and rhythm. Um, harmony. Um, we, we've already been talking about harmony with Heraclitus and uh, Pythagoras. I do think that harmony means something slightly, slightly different in the context of these Greek writings than it does um, in the way we use it in the in the contemporary world but but the difference is not enough to worry about um, uh, so I'm not gonna stress it but I just want to underline it that you got to be a little careful when you read people talking for example about music from a very different culture they don't always think about things quite the same way you do or we do but anyway they talk about harmony and, and rhythm rhythm should be fam familiar enough right that's just the beats you know or whatever um, or the meter of a of a poem, but da 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 right? It's a rhythm, um, and so poems are are metrical. They're rhythmic. They have meter, um, and also the stuff we would normally think of as music. You know, we dance and stuff that has rhythm, but then it also has harmony, which is uh, the sort of stuff I was showing you on the guitar before. Um, in fact, I'm going to uh, um, get my guitar out and do something here. I'm just going to try to play something quickly. I hope we'll make a point. So, shut the window here. I hope you, I'm going to play two little things. And I hope you can reasonably clearly hear the difference between them. So here's the first one. Now here's the second one. you could hear the difference between those two. The first was a major sound. The second was a minor sound. I'll just do them again quickly. The first one's kind of, I think, sort of bright and sunny. The second one, I think, is a little bit sort of uh, darker and moodier. Maybe I can even add a note to that second chord to make that clear. Something like that. Um, you hear this in single notes too. That's major. And then minor. as clear maybe it is but anyway i hope you can hear the difference in fact let me just play two simple chords to get it as clearly as i can i'm just going to play a major and a minor here's a major and here's a minor so so i hope you get the sense there of those different feelings and and the reason for playing these chords or the other one
is so that you can hear that it's not just the simple sound of one chord, but it's a kind of a mood or a kind of a feeling that can be sustained over a song, like through a changing chords. And I was also trying to show it to you with those single notes there, but I think maybe I didn't choose the single notes, the line I was playing that well. Maybe it, maybe it was clear enough. I don't know. Um, but uh, but I, I hope you get the sense of those, that you can hear a difference between what, what we call a major sound and a minor sound. Um, that's that's the, the real thing that they're, they're trying to get at when they talk about harmony here. They're talking about that different quality of sound. Um, you can uh, I won't go into explaining how it works, how you make it happen, but you know you can play one set of notes and they produce this kind of sound and this kind of feeling. You slightly change the notes you're playing and it makes this kind of sound or this kind of feeling. Um, the, the thing that I want to emphasize there is that notion of feeling. I talked about that before when we were talking about uh, Pythagoras, and I just talked about the general movement from the subdominant to the dominant to the tonic chord. From uh, uh, I, I talked about how you can listen to a series of chords and hear a movement from a kind of tension to a kind of resolution. And, and my point there was that just at the level of sound, uh, or at the level of what you hear, the, the sound itself is linked with something kind of affective, something kind of emotional. Um, you you start to feel a kind of desire to have the sound resolve and so on. And I was trying to get at something similar here. You can you can play sounds that sound kind of bright and sunny, or you can play some sounds that kind of sound kind of moody and dark. Um, it's just notes. It's just sound, and yet played in the right set of relationships to each other. Um, these sounds evoke certain kinds of emotional atmosphere. Um, that's that's the thing they're they're going to talk about when they talk about melody. So I'm going to come back and say something about that in a minute. But I wanted to to give you that just to give you a sense of what what that issue is with harmony. So they talk about harmony and rhythm. Um, uh, yeah, well, actually, that's a, and that's as far as they get. So that so they're going through those things from the content of stories to the style of presentation, whether it's narration or imitation, as they call it, and then to the music. They talk about the rhythm and the harmony, and I've just given you a kind of a sense of what harmony is. Um, this Their conversation about those things is, is as convoluted and murky and confused as was the, was the earlier conversation between Socrates and Adamantus. Right? So I was already drawing your attention to the way that um, the conversation is being shaped primarily by Adamantus's views. His in, initial view expressed near the beginning of Book Two about what he thinks stories about the gods do and why they're wrong, and then Socrates has pursued that with him in conversation. He said, "Well, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this?" And Adamantus has ended up uh, affirming quite a few things that that I was saying stand pointedly in contrast to what other texts make it very clear Socrates thinks. So. So they're talking through a topic, and it's a pretty important one, about the education of the guardians and the role that music and ultimately gymnastic have in the formation of the ch children and, and the question of how you, what kind of person you're going to become. They're talking through that pretty important topic, but they, they, uh, they don't do it that well, it seems to me. They make a lot of mis mistakes. I think the mistakes that are made are of a particular type, and I will tell you what I, what I think that particular type is in a little, little while. Um, but what I want, what I'm more interested in, well, so we don't need to go through the details, though it would be interesting, and we could learn about some of the reasons why I think, oh, they made a little mistake here, they made a little mistake here. But, but in a way, I don't particularly care about the details because it seems to me the thing they're talking about is revelatory enough. It, it seems to me that this is a, a pretty profound thought, pretty profound insight that is one of the ones that could really change the way you think about things, right? And and it's basically just about exactly what they say, the educative impact of music. So what Adamantus actually thinks about poems and what he thinks are good and bad stories about the gods, whatever, who cares? But that's the thing you could think about. You could think about what effect it has to hear certain kinds of stories. And so you can think about what effect it has to, to have certain content in stories. You can think about what effect it has to have the story told in a certain way. And the, the examples they give are narration or imitation. Um, I don't know if there are others, 
I mean, basically that's, you know, either you make it clear that this is the voice of the poet, a narrator, or you, you present it as if it were the voice of the characters. And he says some kinds of writing do both, like epic literature has some of each. And you've seen movies like that, where it starts off with somebody narrating, I was in blah, 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 in 1942, and so and such happened, and then it just drifts into watching things acted out, right? So you've seen the mixed style that they talk about here, too. Um, but anyway, that's, so you can think about the, the educative impact of the content of stories, but, but then a step beyond that, you can think about the educative or the, the effect of the way a story is presented. Um, and you can think about the effect of rhythm, and you can think of the effect of harmony. Um, it's uh, you, Typically, when we think about you know, education in university or for children, you know, we usually think, oh, they've got to learn how to read and write and do math, you know, do arithmetic, stuff, that kind of thing. And we tend to think of education as the handing on to someone else of, a, of something that you've learned, um, either some information or some skill. Um, and I think that's a pretty, and well, and we tend to think of that as happening through what you might call direct instruction. Uh, you know, I tell you, oh, you should know this, you should know that. So, you know, when I was giving a, some lectures earlier here on um, Greek history, and I was telling you a little bit about the history of the polis from the Mycenaean world up to the time of the Peloponnesian War, you know, that kind of lecture, like, that's that's kind of what you imagine, what most of us imagine learning or education to be mo most of the time, right? Somebody who knows something tells you the stuff you're supposed to know. Uh or, as I said, also sometimes it's passing on a skill. Like someone says, here's how you play backgammon, or here's how you hit the volleyball or whatever, right? Um, but so one of the things that's so powerful about this part of the Republic is it, it's, it's saying, like, that's not where you should start looking if you're trying to understand education. There's so, there, are, there are much more powerful and much more important ways that we get educated that are much more basic than those things. So yes, of course, people will tell you how to add, and people will tell you how to, you know, um, ride a horse, or whatever. And those things are important, but those things happen when you're, you know, seven or fourteen or twenty-two or whatever. Um, but that by the time those things happen, you have already gone through a lot, and you've become someone. You've become a person uh, who has been very shaped and informed in a lot of ways. And those have to do, those, those are ways that are sort of very personal and interpersonal. Like they're, they have to do with how you handle yourself as an individual and how you handle your relationships with the people around you, your family members and your friends and so on. But they're also cultural. Like they're, they're the ways you learn to be part of, of a society. Remember, we talked about Miletus's answer when Socrates says, you know, who educates the young? And, you know, I said, I said, as does Socrates, that I think Miletus's answers aren't very good. They show that he's never really thought about it. But then I said, you know, let's look at his answers because we can think about it. And maybe we can uh, learn something from his answers, even if he didn't really get the point himself. And one of, one of the things I talked about, for example, was learning Greek. You know, so he says at one point, everybody uh, helps the young, except Socrates, he's bad, but everybody does it. And I, and I said, what sense could we give to that? And I, I mentioned a couple of places in Platon, Platon, the Platonic Dialogues where uh, it is noted that people learn to speak Greek just by hanging around with people. So, so go back, to, so it's that kind of point again, you know, go back to thinking about when you're a little child growing up, the things that you're learning through your associations with the people around you are, are doing things like, in my case, and in the case of, you know, many of the people who listen to this lecture, learning English, you know, in some other countries, learning Farsi or learning um, Marathi or something like that. But whatever it is, the, the one you grow up in, right? You grow up into the language of a culture. And even at that level, those languages have built into them things that are not just universal, right? They're, they're, they're the way that culture talks about things. But but beyond language, there are other things too, right? You you grow up learning how to dress, you know, like, you know, it's a pretty common one in uh, North American society for a long time. You know, more or less, boys are going to grow up learning they're supposed to wear blue and girls are going to grow up learning they're supposed to wear pink. 
or more pointedly than either of those things, boys are going to grow up learning they should not wear pink. That's the big thing they're going to have to learn. Um, uh, and so that's nobody sitting in a lecture hall, you know, telling you like I was about the history of the polis. And that's something that um, children pick up there. Their parents, the child, the boy's parents might not even know how much they're shaped by that. But when they go out to buy clothes for their young son, they just go, oh, and they just go to the blue ones. They don't go look at the pink ones. And the store has already put all the pink ones in the girls' sections and the blue ones in the boys' sections, right? So there's, you know, there's all at the level of the store, at the level of the parents, you know, all kinds of levels. Everything is pushing you to say, the boys are going to go over here, the girls are going to go over here. So by the time the child is involved in dressing, he's wearing blue and he's not wearing pink. And, you know, once upon a time when he saw the pink thing and wanted to go over there to get it, his mom or his dad just steered him over here and said, no, no, that's for the girls. And, you know, take him to the boys' clothes. So, you know, th there was no lecturing there. But uh, there was a, a lot of uh, sort of sex role stereotyping uh, getting built in. Gender norms, gender identification, all kinds of things start, those things start coming in um, very early on. And they come in subtly, often non-verbally. Um, they're coming in when the child can't even speak the language yet. Um, and, the, you know, the child is surrounded by these things and is growing up into certain kinds of expectations about who he or she is supposed to be. And indeed, they're coming into the expectation that they're supposed to be a he or a she. Um, obviously, that's not that's not just made up out of nothing. It's, it's obviously closely related to their the biological function of the body and the role it plays in reproduction. Uh, but, um, you know, there are lots of differences that we don't thematize that much. Like we don't mark out all the people with black hair and all the people with, with light brown hair and, you know, say these are one and these are the other. But, you know, the child's going to learn pretty early on that her or his genitals uh, matter for saying what kind of thing he is. Um, and they matter for more than just the biological reasons. Like, I, I'm not saying... He, he or she is going to real uh, is going to think oh it's more than biological what i mean is the kind of mattering we put on those those anatomical biological features is going to be much more than biological uh, and that that gets picked up right and people start to learn oh it's important to know whether someone is a he or a she and so on right so that stuff's all being built in in those early ways when the parents are talking with the child before it can speak itself. And, you know, there, there are a couple of years of, of just layering this stuff into the little child uh, that, that, that's all, that it's all part of, like, how that little person is going to come to be someone who can function in that surrounding world. So, th so the thing I was emphasizing then is that there's a kind of education that's happening that's very powerful, and it's... Uh, earlier and sort of earlier than that kind of formal lecturing and it's and it's much more basic to your sort of sense of who you are as a functioning being and and it's largely behind the scenes right? so one of the things that's so powerful in this part of the republic is the thematization of that kind of education right that education that takes the child who as they said towards the end of book two right starts off with a kind of plastic soul it could be just about anything but uh a model gets put in there, and pretty soon that becomes ineradicable, right? So that's what they're talking about here, how you move from the openness of the child to a kind of fixity of a sort of specific sense of here's who I am and here's how we do things. And the thing they're talking about here is how that education, we could call it, that, be, that being led into being someone, right? This is education not at the level of facts about the world. It's education at the level of how you are formed as a person, basically, right? We're, they're looking at the forces that go into that. And the thing that they're especially powerfully focusing on are these things that, you know, you might broadly call the arts, music, right? The stories we're told, you know, the fairy tales you read your, your two-year-old as you get ready for bed every night or whatever, right? The stories the children are told and those stories certainly at the level of content, but also at the level of narrative form and also at the level of rhythm, you know, and, 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 and so on and, and harmony, although that that's slightly different. That's not just reading fairy tales that involves a bit more. But um, so so the th one of the things that's so powerful here is the thematizing of those elements and the idea that those things are 
mattering. So the most obvious one in a way is the content of the story. And that's why they start with it first. Um, I, I imagine, right? Like uh, you can think, you can think about that, but the, what the analysis is doing is like um, leading you into recognizing these more subtle things. Um, but so you should think about that. What effect does it have the stories that you watch? Like, um, uh, you know, if you grow up all the time watching the familiar kind of movies that have, you know, men who go out and settle their disputes by fighting uh, and always uh, function as single, independent individuals uh, and women who are always in those stories because they're pretty and that's what the men want and the women are dependent and uh, call on those men both for help in dealing with things and look to those men to be the thing that's going to make their life worth living, right? The man, getting a man is going to be your salvation. And those women are going to spend their time being pretty and, uh, you know, standing in the background, handling stuff in the, in, in the, not on the, not on the front stage, but in the background for, for that man's life and, and having children and so on, right? If you watch enough movies, if, you, if those are the only kind of movies that you watch, and there really aren't that many other kinds of movies, but if you watch, if, you know, you can think, what effect does it have if that's what people watch all the time? And, and I mean, at some level, it's got to be the case that you, you take those things in and you think, oh, yeah, that's what the world is like. That's what men and women are like. And you start to think, oh, yeah, I want to be an independent man and have a pretty wife. Or I want to be a pretty girl and get an independent man or something like that. Um, so, so whatever you think about the specific claims they make about what are the good and bad stories about the gods that Homer tells. Um, you can think about that issue on your own, about the stories in your own world, about the what kind of stories should be told or what effect does it have to sell, tell certain sorts of stories. But now, those stories that we're going to think about, you know, the, the most of what that we're going to see are going to be about human beings interacting with other human beings. But their point is there are other stories too. There are stories about the heroes and stories about the gods. I don't know. I can't. It's not so easy right off the bat to think about familiar things we have that are comparable stories to the stories about the heroes there. But maybe that would be a little bit like if you saw films about, you know, stories about Abraham Lincoln in America uh, or uh, or George Washington, you know, like those are human beings, but they're they're historical figures who've been made kind of mythological. And we think of, you know, we get the story of Lincoln as the guy who was responsible for freeing the slaves or Washington as the guy who was responsible for throwing off the British control and liberating America or something like that. You know, these are, these are not very compelling claims in so far as their historical interpretations, but they're, they're ways that you might think you're talking about a person, but you're actually really talking about a cultural hero and a kind of myth we perpetuate. So stories like that might be things that come close to being what they talk about when they talk not about the stories about humans dealing with humans, but stories about heroes. Uh, and then behind that, the, 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 the thing they start with, and maybe the one that's ultimately most powerful, is the question of the stories about the gods. You know, what does it mean to talk about the stories about the gods? Like you might think, oh, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the gods or whatever. Um, and that's fine. You can think that if you want. But if the, your thinking is at that level, you're probably just going to miss the point of a lot of things that are said. And so stories about the gods means the stories in which a culture talks to itself about what it thinks to be the highest values, the ultimate truths about the way the world works. And so so that's the question, you know, where, so you'd have to think where where do we tell those stories and and how how are the ultimate things portrayed? So, like I said, I'm not going to go through the analysis of their things, but I, the, the analysis they go through. But I wanted to go through sort of the table of contents so you could think about the provocative things they are studying, because you should be studying those things. Right. Uh, and and I also don't mean to suggest that the things that they say are stupid. They're absolutely not. There there are a lot of very brilliant things said here. It's just they're very tricky because the conversation is confusing, and you need to know some things about Greek literature. Um, but that's the stuff there. I was just talking about content. Now, what about this question about um, style? That's where I actually want to dig into the book just a little bit. 
So this is uh, 392C is where it starts. He says, you know, they, um, the thing they accomplish with the narrative, this is, this is actually a D, I guess. Uh, the conversation started at C, but, but this, he says at D, the, 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 they accomplish the thing they're trying to do through the narrative either uh, simply or by imitation. And then um, Adamantus says, what, uh, what do you mean by that? And Socrates goes through and explains it. What, so what he says there is like you can see that poets um, sometimes sometimes say things you know directly sort of in their own voice and sometimes they cr construct these imitations ca characters speaking speaking for themselves and so so he says you know we're gonna have to figure out you know what effect that has should we let should poets be doing that is that a good thing that, but then bef before they talk directly about poetry they take a little step back and they say well should should our guardians be imitators so again it's one of those many places in the republic as in any platonic dialogue where the conversation takes a couple of twists that aren't they don't give you good signposts and they're kind of like confusions and you can just be led along with the conversation without thinking it through. I'm not going to work through this one in detail, but basically they, sh they shift here from talking about whether the poets should imitate in their presentations to whether a person should imitate. And, and so he basically says, well, like, what are good people like? Do good people imitate? Like, let's imagine you're telling a story. And, and the, the, the thing he says is the thing that Adam Adamantus, um, basically affirms and it, or agrees to as Socrates proposes it and so on is that if you think about a you know a sort of a gentleman is what they're talking about if you think about a refined adult you know how does that person speak you know does does that person say uh you know if they're going to say what did you do this afternoon do they act out the exchange or do they say well uh you know, in a calm tone of voice. Well, I spoke to the cashier and I asked her if I could have uh, a so and such thing, and and then uh, she, but she was she was uh, she was unhelpful, um, and so I tried to explain myself to her, but she seemed not to understand it, and so ult ultimately I grew dissatisfied with her behavior and I departed. You know, I mean, I, nobody would say that exact thing, but I'm trying to present. Um, I'm trying to present a, a, a certain way someone would describe something. And that, that would be different from saying like, yeah, so I went into the store and like, I asked the cashier, can I have this? And she's like, blah, 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 blah. You know, except I wouldn't in my narration be saying blah, blah. I'd be trying to imitate her. And she's like, did you want a co coffee toffee with that under the blah, blah, blah? And, and I said, oh, no, no, that's not what I'm talking about. You don't get it. And she says, oh, I mean, there's no reason for you to get da, 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 right? Like, in other words, you can imagine another way someone would tell a story where they don't adopt a view of describing an, an event outside them in the world, but they try to act out the characters. Right? And the basic point that they make here is refined adults don't do that. That's, that's how that's how cruder people do things. And, and they also say, you know, what, um, what, what else would you imitate? Would a refined person, you know, be imitating uh, the sounds that uh, animals make, you know, and the sounds you make in the bathroom, or, you know, would, would they say, um, I walked in the yard and, and, uh, there was a, there was a pig there and blah, blah, blah. Or would they say, yeah, I was walking there and I heard oink, 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 you know, you can imagine someone doing that. It would be a much less refined kind of conversation or, you know, similar things about burping or whatever else. So the thing he says, that, the thing they say there is like, if you imagine a person's conversation, He's saying, you know, the refined people, the kind of people that we think are well developed, don't don't imitate just anything. They don't imitate much. And when they do imitate, the things they're going to imitate are themselves fairly refined. Whereas someone who, in his or her their behavior, is constantly imitating everything, seems kind of like a goofball, a low, uh, unrefined goof. You know. So you can read that through and you can you can think about it what you want. But but I, but it seems to me they're actually identifying something real. And that's what I was trying to capture in my quick attempt to act out a couple of things. I mean, I was acting. I was imitating two different kinds of speakers to make the point. But the people I was portraying, one basically didn't imitate and the other did. And I tried to play up, you know, the more refined versus the more crude character, um, because I think through doing that, you can kind of recognize they're talking about something real like you do know the phenomenon they're talking about you may 
think of it a little bit differently or you may think there's more to it than that but but you should be able to recognize the kind of thing they're saying and so and so he says you know if you're going to be if you're going to be a refined person like you don't want to grow up imitating you especially don't want to grow up imitating the behaviors of of bad people um and he says um so they say at 380 395d socrates says haven't you observed that imitations if they're practiced practice continually from youth onwards become established as habits and nature in body and sounds and in thought oh sorry habits and nature in body and sounds and in thought um uh i mean i'll give i'll give you a simple version of that i mean uh but i mean basically saying if, if you you know practice thing and practice imitating the thing enough it's just going to become your way of doing things and there seems to be some truth to that i'll give you one example of that it's it's not quite the same point but it's a similar thing that's swearing you know when i was a kid growing up you know the people would usually say you know you shouldn't swear and uh as a rule adults around me and around children in my experience tried not to do that and so we as kids at a certain point learned to swear and we knew it was kind of naughty and we liked to do it and so on uh at, but you know so probably what should have happened is that as i grew up i became a little bit more adult and exercised a bit more restraint in my swearing and i didn't actually do a very good job of that and consequently i i uh various kinds of uh swearing are a regular part of my life um <coughs> and i noticed that around my son like i <laughs> Uh, I kind of think I should be talking like my my parents did and uh, showing a little bit more restraint. But I just hear these words coming out of my mouth when I'm just uh, talking around him, talking casually with someone else, and I'll say you know something that I needn't repeat on the camera. Uh, and I realize, oh, you know, my son was listening to that. I should have been more careful. So my point there is just that that that's an example of. The fact that I like I basically practiced that thing through my life, even though I sort of thought probably I shouldn't do that. I just let myself practice it. And now I can't really stop it. Right. And so that and so in a way, that's it's not quite imitation, but it's living out of a certain mode of speaking. And there is a way that I now speak in a way that um, is probably not the way I would choose to speak, at least in the context of trying to fill out the role of parent and so on. Um, but so anyway, haven't you observed imitations if they're practiced continually from youth onwards become established as habits and nature in body and sounds and in thought? Um, anyway, so that's that's one thing. But then just a little bit more about imitation. He says, um, oh, here's the thing about, a, you know, that I was saying about a responsible per, a adult. He says, this is at 396C. Um, when a sensible man comes in his narrative to some speech or deed of a good man, he'll be willing to report it as though he himself were that man. He'll imitate the, the good man, blah, 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 blah. But when he meets with someone unworthy of himself, he won't be willing seriously to represent himself as that. And so they go through that so that Socrates can explain to Adamantus what these two styles are, narration and imitation. And then they basically go on uh, in that context to say, um they're they're saying they 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 just they try to distinguish the different uh really political effect those things can have and especially uh three right around three 397 and 398 you know they they say you know this this imitative stuff can be kind of could be kind of dangerous and they wonder if they should not allow it in the city um so that's a, that's a thing to think about uh I, i'm not going to pursue their their line of argumentation there, though I think it's pretty powerful. And so it's a significant part of the book uh, for some people of the Republic. Um, but it's an opportunity for you to think about what effect it has. Now, now we're not talking about you just imitating things. We're talking about in the portrayals and stories, whether you get imitations or narration, they talk about what effect it has to have portray portrayals in the form of imitation. Um, you know, I think one thing is that uh, when basically someone acts as if they're the person they're portraying, rather than narrating, this person did that. Um, it can it can lead you. It it removes some distance. It can lead you to be kind of taken in by that thing, um, and that might be part of the reason it's it's a problem. Could be also interesting, but. That, that's one of the things I'd like you to think about. Anyway, so again, I'm just going through some of the, some of the general ideas to try to get them going in your mind. 
rhythm. Uh, well, I guess I'll get, yeah, I guess I'll say something about rhythm and harmony together. You know, I tried to play those little things, the difference between the major and the minor, uh, to try to bring out this way that just by sort of manipulating sounds, your emotions can be manipulated. And you surely you know that rhythms can do that too. You know, you, there, there's a, you know, the gentle swing beat with the brushes and the symbol of a, of a jazz tune that makes you think you're going to fall asleep um, in a, uh, I don't know, some hotel lobby. And then there's the, you know, the, I don't know, some kind of hip hop beat or something that makes you feel like, oh, you're going to go uh, dance and have a wild party in some special club or something like that like I, I don't know but like my, my point is you can you can you can hear a couple of different kinds I'm just thinking of drummers right you can hear a couple of different rhythms uh, one that might immediately make you feel like you're going to go to sleep the other that might make you feel like I want a party my, and my point there is just that rhythm th those things you know without particular pitch um, without harmony without melody just at the level of rhythm those things can really move you to make you feel like dancing, to make you feel bored, and there are, there are other feelings to rhythms too, besides just besides just those two, and then the harmonies, you know, manipulate your feelings. So, what I wanted you to think about there was just how much the rhythm and the harmony, as they say, in in as much as they are part of the thing that's being presented to you, how much they're actually moving your soul, right? How much your being well, let's put that differently. How much something is being communicated to you, not at the level of words presenting you with concepts and information. Something is being presented to you, but it's being presented at a non-conceptual, non-factual level. Uh, it's not being presented through words. It's being presented through the, the rhythm and harmony. It's, in, it's being presented through the sounds and how the sounds are being presented. And it's also not uh, affecting you at the level of thinking it's directly coming in at the level of your feelings and moving them around. And so um, that's why movies have soundtracks. That's why ads have music. You know, they they try to manipulate you. They try to make you feel certain ways about their products or about the things that are happening in certain scenes. So, so this conversation here in book three, coming out of book two, but then especially all this stuff in book three, which is more detailed, is really about the different elements of presentation, you know, mu musical, poetic presentation, the, the different ways in which something is presented to you and how something is communicated to you at a level other than just the explicit narrative. Like even at the, when we're still talking about content, you know, it's one thing to hear that, oh yeah, uh, and then uh, Zeus, uh, Kronos's son uh, killed him or something like that, right? You think it's just a story about some, some this happened between these two characters. But Socrates' point is, well, you're actually being a story about, told the story about the gods. So you think you're just hearing a nice little narrative about some event. But there's kind of a, maybe you could call it a meta-narrative there about the ultimate nature of things, right? About the gods. So from the level of, uh, even at the level of content from the very beginning, the thing they've been highlighting is the way stories move you and stories communicate to you and tell you things um, at levels other than just the explicit thing that it's about, right? And that should remind you too, what I just said should really remind you of uh, what's almost the opening, it's not quite the opening sentence, but it's one of the opening things in the Republic. Remember when Paul and Marcus um, grabs, or gets his slave to grab Socrates, and then he comes down and he says, um, uh, either you have to prove stronger than those of us who are trying to hold you here, or you got to come with us. And Socrates says, isn't there another possibility? Couldn't I persuade you? And, and Socrates said, I mean, um, Paul and Marcus said, well, could you persuade us if we don't listen? And one of the things I noted to you there is that Glaucon says, no, of course not. And I thought, you know, you might wonder what Socrates would have said if Glaucon hadn't interrupted. Well, here, what you're seeing is, like, you didn't know you were listening to these other things, but these stories are persuading you. They're persuading you by how they're portraying the gods they're pers their, or the heroes or the people. They're persuading you by the style of presentation. Is it narrative or imitation? They're persuading you by the rhythm and the harmony that they're using, by the music. Those things are getting into you and persuading you. And at least you don't know that you're listening. Or I guess another way of saying that is 
you're listening to things that you're not even aware that you're listening to. So in other words, you can be persuaded, going back to that opening thing, in, in a sense, you can be persuaded even if you're not listening in as much as persuasion is happening at levels other than the level where you at least explicitly take yourself to be listening or not. Like it, you might think, I don't care about the gods. And it turns out, yeah, well, maybe actually you do in ways you don't even know about. And your views are, have, have been and are being shaped and manipulated. Uh, so now let's skip ahead to the end of that discussion of music. So, uh, and this will fit, I think, with what I just said. This is 401D. So Socrates says, um, so Glaucon, I said, isn't this why the rearing, you know, being raised and educated in music is most sovereign? Because rhythm and harmony most of all insinuate themselves into the inmost part of the soul and most vigorously lay hold of it in bringing grace with them. So I'm going to come back to that in a second. But the point I want, I want to make there is that he, the thing they're getting at is the way these things insinuate themselves into you. And here they do it in this really intimate way, right? The level of your feelings. Now, what's this thing about grace? Well, um, they, that's, let's go back just a little bit before 401 A and B, painting, weaving, blah, blah, blah. In all of them, there is grace or gracelessness. And gracelessness, clumsiness, inharmoniousness, those are akin to bad speech and bad disposition, while their opposites, which would be gentle, grace, grace, uh, the opposite of clumsiness, uh, can't even think what that is, uh, harmoniousness and so on, those are akin to and imitations of the opposite, namely moderate and good disposition. Um, so the idea is, so, so if you ask about all this, well, so what is it that that's that's being so you, like you might say yeah sure i can see that music affects me emotionally like but what's the educative significance of that well he says here like what what you're really learning through that is you're grappling with the issue of grace which is something like in this case you might say perfection of form let's say and so a musical education, which doesn't mean learning that Chopin wrote this or that sonata form is like this and this. An education in music would mean growing up, having had, you know, musical experiences that are formative of how you feel and so on. Musical education is going to shape your relationship to that issue of the fit of a form. In music, I guess you... Uh, you get a strong sense of how things can be beautiful. Uh, actually, maybe that would be a good way to put this. Maybe you could think about what what the significance is of experiencing beauty, right? And what, what educative effect that has. Like, sure, it's nice, but, but there might be deeper issues there. Like, what, what effect does it have on you to ha have experiences of beauty? You know, what does that tell you about the world? Um, you know, because one thing is beauty is sort of about things that, you know, you, you get it just right. You know, and when those things are just right, like they seem to speak to you of something really special. In another dialogue called the Phaedrus, Socrates says that beauty is kind of the way that the, the highest and most important things like ultimate, the ultimate truths, you know, shine through in this world. Um, uh, and, uh, it's kind of the shine of the divine uh, and you might you might just think about that as an idea like so what you know when you see something beautiful sometimes it, it holds that promise of something sort of ideal or something better you know something above the instrumental everyday prosaic world of life and and you know music is at some level surely like that right when you hear music going back to this idea of fit like everything is exactly where it's supposed to be and it's all organized towards the perfect single purpose of completing this tune, right? There's nothing in your daily life that's like that. And music, you know, a tune doesn't have a period where you get tired and fall asleep and it doesn't have a period where you get angry at your friend and get bored and throw things down and break it. Like th those things don't make it into the recording, right? The recording is all about everything nailing it, right? And so in that way, it's very different from the way you're, life normally would be and it's kind of a vision of a different kind of life in that sense um, 
And uh, and again, thinking more about think a bit more about music. I want to I want to bring this back. I, that that was me sort of trying to talk a little bit about grace and so on. But I want to bring it back to one other thing. Um, you know, if you think about music, like I I play music a fair bit, and so I have these issues on my mind. Um, they might be less on the mind of someone who doesn't play, but maybe they would be anyway. But but, but someone to, for, for someone who plays, I think you can definitely experience in your own playing or in the playing of the people around you a difference between. Um, let's say self-indulgence and restraint or something like that. Um, you know, sometimes people play and you think, yeah, you know, you're doing that because you, you're having a good time and you're entertaining yourself, but you're not really thinking about what the music needs. You know, that would be self-indulgence. And so doing what the music needs involves a certain kind of restraint. It means knowing, you know, when not to play you know, and so on. Um, uh, and then um, there, there are other ways where you could think music could be daring. I mean, this is especially true. I mean, it's probably true in all kinds of music, but, you know, I'm, I'm mostly interested in jazz. And, um, you know, you really notice it in the context of people improvising, that sometimes people do musically very daring things. And um, they're both daring. Sometimes they're daring at the level of technique, like people put themselves in situations where it's going to be hard for them to play it, you know. Uh, but also they can be, you know, they're musically daring in the sense that they go in a direction where, like, you wouldn't have expected this to happen. You don't quite know what's going to come from doing that. But people sort of do something that seems musically right to them at the time. And then you hope the rest of the band can go along with it and, you know, amazing things come out of it. And you then hear things in the music you never would have anticipated, you know. And sometimes those things can be so uh, daring that they actually redefine how subsequent people play music. Like, they can sort of break break rules and show people a new way of playing so i just wanted to bring out those notions right like sort of daring um self-indulgence restraint like those it seems to me are notions that really do fit in the world of music and they would also fit in the world of painting and in architecture and sculpture or any of the arts uh, poetry um and so uh that's not so far from moderation and courage, what I was calling, you know, restraint and, um, you know, appropriate restraint and daring. In each case, the thing that makes those things musical is that you're doing what the music calls for. So the, the idea about self-indulgence is you're doing something that, yeah, you're having a good time, but the music didn't really need that. The music would be better if you'd restrained yourself. But it doesn't just mean always being restrained is the right thing. And that's sort of the point about being daring. Like sometimes you really got to go for it and, and step up and assert yourself in a way that nobody else was going to expect. But that's not self-indulgence, it turns out. That's a little bit more like courage. That's seeing something the music is really calling for and a place it could really go and trying to do it, you know. So um, uh being able to show some moderation in how you handle your own desires is, is, is a moral attribute, but it's pretty closely related to what's called for in, in uh, making good, good music. And being courageous is, again, being prepared to do something personally demanding and risky because you think the situation calls for it. And that's also is very closely related to what people do in music. So in the point there then is that I was already saying, you know, music affects your feelings, but the values intrinsic to music are very, at a kind of emotional level, quite closely related to the values that make good character. And so that's that, and that's then that's how they talk about it in these in these pages pages right around here. They're talking about music as, in a way, reflecting different modes of character. And then on the other hand, there there is, there is self-indulgent music. There, there's a difference between the stuff that's really good and the stuff that's not really good. And that, that stuff that's not so good reflects a lack of restraint, reflects an absence of daring, you know, reflects a reliance on guaranteed things that, that just conform to familiar models and don't really care about whether the music develops because you know you got a success here, right? Well, think of, that's a model. And you might think, yeah, I like those tunes. I like a hit tune, you know. But think about that as a model for human life. It does, it's not very inspiring. Right? So there you can see how 
your education into music, your musical diet, so to speak, um, can be feeding, if I can carry on the eating metaphor with diet, right? can be feeding something about your character, you know, where, where, what you're attuned to and what you're, what you aspire to. So I wanted, so that's, that's me trying to take the things that they say that I think are quite powerful and without going through the details they give, just use those notions to reflect on what I imagine are our own fairly familiar experiences of music to try to bring out um, some of the sense of what that might mean. And so um, I'm going to pause there and, and, and wrap this, this one up and then we'll come back and do gymnastic and lead that into the next, uh, into book four. But what I was really then hoping to get out of here was to complete that discussion we started last time with the end of book two. Uh, you know, there, there they sort of launched the project of seeing, you know, how we're going to educate the guardians. And they chose to do that by saying, we're going to look at music first and then gymnastic, which we'll go on to do here. Um, I wanted to, to talk about the way they discuss an education in music in book three, not so much by dealing with their specific examples, but by just sort of following the structure of the argument they make and to reflect philosophically on what some of those things might mean. So I hope that I've been able to show something of the plausibility and power of the kind of analyses they're making. I, I just want to add one more point. So, you know, and I've been talking about this, you know, at the level of, you know, thinking about how these things affect you personally and so on and the development of the person. I want to add this one thing. You know, I talked about how, you know, the child growing, is growing up and it's learning certain sort of cultural things about gender, gender roles and um, learning a language, all that kind of stuff, how to dress and so on. Um, now I've talked about the you know what it means for you to have a certain kind of musical diet, but I also then want to talk about a culture's decision about decisions about music. Like, it's not just that you happen to choose to listen to certain kinds of music, right? There's massive, there's a massive recording industry, and massive advertising, and massive this and that, right? Um, the music you and we listen to is not so much a matter of personal choice as it is the sort of decision our culture is made by whatever ways it makes decisions, you know, which largely means handing decision making over to big money making corporations. Um, but dis decisions have been made about what music we're going to listen to. And, uh, and that's what we that, that's what we really want to think about. That's what they really want to think about. You know, what does it matter? The kinds of music that a culture cultivates? What effect does that have on the way its citizens are growing up and educated? What, and what effect does it have at the level of how they develop character, which means these things like moderation and courage and so on? How it affect their, their, their way they relate to their own desires, their way they relate to their own uh, thumos, you know, that sense that I want to win, the way, the way they relate to the values of thinking and so on. We're, we're going to talk about those things a bit more soon. Um, uh, but that's what I want you really to think about is, is the effect on us, the citizens of this sort of cultural music industry that's, that's, it, that's impressed upon us and what, what effect that's having on shaping what kind of culture we have and what kind of people are in it. Um, and we've been, we've been trying to talk here about the sort of at the level of sort of direct impact on your psyche, on your psychology, what what happens when you hear stories and music and so on. And so the idea is to take that way that people are being shaped and think, okay, what are, what are the cultural forces we have that are playing on those powers? So that's what this first half of book three uh, is about. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to leave it there. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about gymnastic.